you very much for joining us. We're excited to have you um, with us this morning to talk about our work with the uh, Firearms Pilot Site Initiative in tribal communities. Um, I'm Nancy Hart, as Patricia just said, a Senior Program Attorney here at the Council, uh, and I'm going to let the other presenters briefly identify themselves. Hi, I'm Darren Mitchell. I'm a consultant to the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Uh, I've been working with uh, the Council on firearms issues for many years, and I'm very glad to be able to speak with you about this issue this afternoon or morning. And hi, I'm Caroline Laporte. I am an immediate descendant of the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. I am also the Senior Native Affairs Policy Advisor at the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Thank you. So we're going to start with just a quick review of some of the things we're going to cover today, the objectives for this webinar. Um, we're, you're going to learn quite a bit about the Firearms Pilot Site Initiative, which um, some of our goals, the timeline and the structure of the project, some of the anticipated activities that we'll be doing during the project, um, benefits for communities that decide to participate, and uh, the application process. We'll also talk about opportunities that tribal communities, all communities have to use existing laws to prevent abusers' access to firearms in civil cases involving domestic violence, particularly civil protection order cases, and similarly opportunities to use existing laws to, do, um, to, to prevent abusers' access in criminal domestic violence cases. I'll take a moment here to say that some of you may have participated in a webinar that we held on April 26th about this project, um, and we we talked about some of these strategies at that point. We'll we'll remind you later, but if um, you are interested in a in listening to that webinar for some of those details that we covered in that, we will make that available to you. Um, but today, again, we will also be talking about ways in which national and local experts will be assisting tribal and non-tribal FIPSI sites. FIPSI is our um, abbreviation for the Firearms Pilot Site Initiative, and sites will be selected. We'll go into that in a little bit, but um, those sites will have the benefit of national and local experts working on planning and implementing project activities to take advantage of the opportunities that we'll be describing today and to produce strategies in their community to protect victims and others from firearms violence. And today also we just hope that uh, you, you leave having learned a little bit more about the issue of firearms and domestic violence in Indian country and how you can receive further assistance from us and, and other TA providers. So I'm going to jump in now and talk a little bit about uh, um, the challenge of firearms in domestic violence cases all across the country, both obviously in Indian country and, um, and elsewhere. And a lot of our whole orientation towards addressing this challenge for society is a public health and safety one. And so when we talk about what we're trying to accomplish, we use language that's consistent with our goals of improving health and safety for our communities, for victims, for their children, and for broader members of the community as well, outside of the immediate family that, that may be plagued by intimate partner um, or domestic violence. So, um, so we're going to start off with that sort of public health orientation and help you understand a little bit about some of the research behind um, wh why we understand this is, being, is such a huge challenge for our country and, um, and also a little bit about some of the interventions that appear, at least in some initial research, um, to be helping. And I'm happy to report that uh, we met with a researcher in the field just a couple of weeks ago, and, um, and specific research focused on interventions and their efficacy is, uh, is, is, is a, big, it's a big focus of the researchers now, and I think we're going to see more and more studies on how particular interventions, whether they work or not, for, um, for safeguarding victims, children, and communities. So let me start off by talking just about this overall project and the fact that um, research shows that mere access to a firearm um, by an abuser is the single greatest risk factor that uh, in an abusive relationship that one of the intimate partners uh, will be killed by the other. And so of all the risk factors out there, I know many of you who work in this field are aware of 
of the risk factors, and there's more and more uh, of a movement amongst all stakeholders to take a, a closer look at risk. The one that always rises to the top is access to guns, not necessarily ownership of guns um, or even possession, but having access to um, is, is the indication that there may be an ITV homicide that results. And so if you look at homes that have guns versus homes that don't have guns, the presence of a, fire, a firearm in the home increases by eightfold the chance that, the, um, that there will be a homicide in that family um, where the offender is, is an intimate partner of the victim in the relationship. And it rises to 20-fold the increase in risk if they're in that, in that relationship there's a prior history of abuse. And so clearly this is where a huge amount of our risk is. If you look at fatality reviews from around the country in many, many states and, and communities, um, firearms and, and also national um, research on the incidence of domestic violence and, and intimate partner homicide that the FBI does, guns are far and away the uh, greatest instrument of death. And, um, and in many of these studies, all other weapons whether it's hands through strangulation or other means um, or other kinds of weapons, firearms is, are used to a greater extent than all the other forms combined. So um, in addition to that, we wanted to share that, um, that the, uh, generally speaking in this IPV, I just said that firearms are, are used, it's about two-thirds of the um, IPV homicides where a gun is at issue uh, or, or was used. And, Interestingly, we are seeing a, um, at least through 2010, we saw that proportion go down somewhat. So perhaps there's some efficacy around our efforts to address guns and domestic violence because uh, guns do seem to be going down. But if you look at local states, I just looked at a, at a review from, um, from a state where we're going to do another training, guns are far and away the, the weapon of choice. Now, the other thing to think about in terms of firearms in the, in the context of intimate partner um, violence is that guns are not only used to kill victims, but they're also used as tools in, um, in coercive controlling or other forms of, of uh, abuse or dominance over your partner. And so merely having the gun present, cleaning the weapon, referring to the weapon, um, things like that are, can, can create incredible trauma amongst victims and are used effectively as tools to, to continue to, uh, um, to exert power and control over the abused partner. And um, Susan Sorensen at the University of Pennsylvania and some others have been really focused on this issue of the fact that there's high trauma and heavy use of guns beyond just killing other people. And that's something to keep in mind too in the context of addressing this problem. Um, but Thankfully, we have seen through some uh, research that there is a, there's a way to address this um, through various interventions. And some research studies have shown that court-ordered surrender of firearms um, can be effective in getting guns out of abusers' hands, depending on the system and, and whether there's follow-up and things like that. And secondly, that where there are um, prohibitions on firearms access, and as we'll see in a little bit, that's true of states around the country, but it's also uh, true of several tribe, tribal codes that address specifically um, firearm access by abusers when there's a protection order. Those prohibitions on a sort of macro level in the states in some studies and in, the city, in some cities in another study actually show an overall reduction in homicide and specifically intimate partner homicide. So having those laws in the books has a result, has a positive um, public health benefit. And so a lot of what we're focused on through the FIPSI project is both in the civil and the criminal context, how to make those kinds of laws really effective, how to implement them in a way that we're going to get guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them, how to do it collaboratively, how to do it um, strategically. And that's what we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about today. Um, I referred to these uh, intimate partner homicide reductions in cities and states, and this is the research for those of you who want to take a look at the studies. We can get them for you if you want. One of the interesting results of the study is that where abusers don't have access to a gun because they weren't able to purchase a gun and didn't otherwise get one, the, the homicide numbers go down. It does not appear that abusers, and many of you who work with victims and abusers could, you know, anecdotally would say that this is the case, um, that abusers don't go and find other weapons. 
to commit homicide. If they don't have access to the, to the weapon, you're largely stopping the homicide. So there's no what researchers call substitution effect with other weapons in these kinds of cases. And so there's a lot of hope for the work that we're doing, and that really under, underpins a lot, uh, uh, our approach to all of this, this public health approach and the hope that, um, that, that better implementation of these laws can make a real difference for our victims, our children, and our communities. Thank you, Darren. And, you know, the Firearms Pilot Side Initiative grew out of the recognition that we've had these laws uh, in many cases on the books. Well, the federal laws certainly have been around for more than 20 years, but in the states and tribes, there have been um, laws passed over those past 20 years, and we certainly know that the statistics span over the last more than 20 years to, to show us that this is a this is an issue that needs attention. And so we were really, the NCJFCJ was really excited when the pilot site initiative um, came out from OVW and, um, and we are in the beginnings of implementing the project. Um, and, and the objectives of the FIPC, the Firearms Pilot Site Initiative, are to, to select five to seven communities and provide intensive technical assistance to those communities um, working to improve their response to firearms in both or either criminal and civil domestic violence cases. Um, and we do anticipate that at least one site will be a tribal community. Um, we, we plan to implement, ex sorry, to obtain and disseminate information about effective strategies and lessons learned this is a demonstration project, or a, uh, so, so by the end of the time, we will want to be able to point to things that have worked in the communities that we've been working with, uh, things that haven't worked so well, things that have worked particularly well, because of course we would like to be able to tell other communities, um, present them with models and strategies that have been effective. The project will also be identifying approaches that protect victims children and others while also promoting victim autonomy and safeguarding offenders due process rights. Talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but um, it's really important to us. It's a really core value of ours to, to respect victim autonomy and to, to do as much as possible to honor what it is that, that works, what, listen to what the victim knows uh, is safe for, for her, um, while at the same time, recognizing that offenders have rights and, and those also need to be recognized. Um, the project will include peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and other ways that we could put communities in touch with one another that, so that they can grow from and learn from what other communities have been doing um, to, and share ideas and help to solve problems that they're encountering as they do this work. A little bit about the structure of the project. Um, as I say, we'll be choosing five to seven projects, and at least one will be tribal. Um, we're looking for as broad diversity as we can manage in the, in the midst of the applicants, um, both in terms of ge geography, um, demographics, urban versus rural, um, diversity as far as their legal framework. Some some jurisdictions are going to have strong laws on their books. Other jurisdictions may not have such strong laws. And what we're hoping is that we can have um, some communities from, with, with different experiences so that we learn more and have more tools that we can share with other communities by the end of the project. We may also have diversity as far as the challenges that they're um, encountering their, in their community. We find that a lot of communities have common challenges. Uh, everything from, you know, where to store the guns to how do you get, how do you actually get them surrendered. Th there's certainly so many common problems, but different jurisdictions, that, different sites that we select may have different issues that they're trying to address. We've mentioned a few times that we will focus on both civil and criminal. Um, the sites may or may not be doing each individual site may or may not be doing both, uh, might do one or the other, but we're certainly uh, encompassing both and hoping to address both of those issues. There will be an evaluation component to the project. Um, we're, we're, in fact, we're, we have an assessment tool that we're going to be making available to applicants for the 
sites um, that will help to identify what the challenges are in the jurisdiction. And part of that will be the beginnings of trying to identify some quantitative and qualitative measures that will help you determine whether your, your work is effective, your work is, is being successful. And then again, we will be providing intensive TA and training to those sites, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and idea sharing. Um, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and other uh, TA, national TA providers that have been providing TA on firearms will be involved in this. Some of our collaborating partners are, uh, besides NIWRC, are the International Association of Chiefs of Police, IACP, um, Equitas, the Prosecutor's Resource for Violence Against Women, uh, BWJP, the Battered Women's Justice Project, uh, the Center for Court Inter Innovation, and the National Center on Domestic Violence in the Black Community, I think called Ujima. So all of those TA providers will be available to the sites that are selected. And maybe the best bullet on this page is the fact that we are really delighted to know that OVW has um, said that there will be funding available for a project coordinator at each of the selected sites, which we know is um, really a tremendous help in making something happen in the community. So just very briefly, the timeline that we're on in this project, we are in the midst of working with OVW to finalize a call for concept papers. OVW will be releasing that sometime in the early summer of this, so the next few couple of months. Um, the applications will be due um, by late summer. We're anticipating an approximately 90-day window of time to get your applications in um, with the expectation that, that we, OBW and, and NCJFCJ working collaboratively, will select sites before the end of November. Um, and then over the winter, early winter, uh, December, January, we're anticipating that the, the newly selected sites will be putting together collaborative teams in their communities um, and also beginning the process, finding out about the funding and then hopefully hire, beginning the process of hiring a coordinator. And then early next year, the sites will be evaluating themselves using an assessment tool and doing other planning to get ready for an all-sites meeting, which will be next summer, summer of 2018. And then there's this three-year period following that, which would be further planning and further implementation of um, the, the specific goals and objectives that each site wants to take on. So that would be 2019 through 2022. Um, so altogether sort of a four-year project or four-year commitment for the community, um, the, the communities that get selected. Oh, one, oops, sorry. So OBW will be holding a pre-application call approximately two or three weeks after the call for concept papers is released. Very tentatively right now, we're talking about the release of the concept paper being maybe in the second week of July. So um, talking about a call for, I mean, a pre-application call towards the end of July, um, that's very tentative. But that's the sort of time frame that we're looking at. I'm going to hand it over to Darren at this point. Yeah, thank you. And um, so, uh, so that's the project and that, that pre-application call. Um, in terms of filling out the application and uh, and how to decide whether your site is one that should apply and also how to succeed in that process. The pre-application webinar will give lots of information around that. We wanted to spend today um, on, some, on sharing some specific strategies that your communities could be thinking about to improve the response to domestic violence and firearms in both civil and criminal cases. And um, to give you a sense of the kinds of um, technical assistance you can expect from this project if you're chosen as a site, the way we analyze and think about 
systems and system change in this area to give you a sense of, of all of that. And at the end, we'll talk about if you have any questions, who you can who can, you can get in touch with for assistance, even if you don't apply for the uh, for the FIPSI project. But we wanted to give you a, a sense of of how we do our work in this area. And there are some sort of fundamental strategies for success that we just wanted to touch on very briefly um, before we dive into the legal systems and and specific steps of the legal system that provide opportunities for improvement. And a huge one, of course, is leadership. And um, we've learned that that effective Committed leadership is really essential um, to success in improving our community's responses to guns and domestic violence. And I wanted to share just a couple of thoughts of our thoughts around leadership. One is the recognition that it can come from anywhere. It can come from any stakeholder. It can come from outside of the legal system as well. But uh, it's not necessarily a judge who steps in and says, my court is not doing a good enough job in here. Let's get going on this. It can come from any other stakeholder group. It can come from advocacy service providers. It can come from prosecution, law enforcement agencies. Your tribal council may have a member who's specifically uh, energized on this topic. Um, we help identify and grow leadership amongst all those stakeholder groups and uh, would continue to do so under this, um, under this project. And being a leader in this area really means being, understanding and, and being responsive to your community's culture and traditions. We know that. There's not a cookie-cutter approach to this. It really takes uh, engaging with the community and addressing the concerns and needs of the community. Um, and of course, your traditions and culture um, informs that and is essential to, um, to really incorporate into any project. So, that, so we know that, and that's part of what this project is going to do. And a leader needs to be able to understand that and also be able to talk about the issues around guns and domestic violence effectively to frame it in a way that sort of focuses, as I mentioned earlier, on the public health and safety benefits of responding to res abusers' access to guns without communicating that you're taking everyone's gun away, but to really be more nuanced and responsive to what your community's um, uh, values and traditions are. Um, clearly, there's a whole lot more that we can say about leadership. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it along and, and just know that this, you know, be assured that this is part of this project. And, um, and we know that there'll be great lessons learned around leadership. As Nancy mentioned, that will be part of our responsibility is getting that out to folks around the country as we move through and beyond um, this particular project. Thanks, Darren. And another super fundamental thing that, it, that goes really hand in glove with leadership is collaboration. Um, and, and certainly a core principle of the work that we're doing in this area is that effective, sustainable improvement in the processes and practices in the community is only possible with meaningful collaboration among all the relevant stakeholder professions. And, you know, I think all of us would agree that firearms enforcement in particular uh, is a very interdisciplinary, multi, multidisciplinary uh, area where everybody needs to be working together. So the stakeholder professions would be the courts, the judiciary, um, law enforcement, prosecution, the community-based victim advocates, the defense bar, um, community supervision or probation. Uh, it really, anybody that you know, can think of that touches upon the, the system would, would be needed to be at the table. And it's super important that that collaboration happen at the beginning and be continuing throughout the project because that's what's going to make it uh, effective and it's, it's what we hope will make it sustained, sustained as well. Um, part of the reason that we're having this, again, we had a webinar on April 26th, but we wanted to have uh, a specific webinar that is focused on the project within tribal communities because we really want to encourage tribal communities to apply for this, but also want to make sure that everybody knows that we are we are very interested in being responsive to the unique challenges that are presented um, and unique opportunities that are presented in tribal communities. We uh, had, this is a sort of a summary slide of a few things that have gone on in the last few years um, that are around our work with, around firearms and domestic violence in Indian country. A little over, well, I guess it was a little over two years ago, um, we had a firearms forum in Detroit, Michigan, and as part of that meeting, we there was a breakout um, 
for a, a tribal group of folks that had come to that meeting and wanted to have a separate conversation around firearms and domestic violence in Indian country. So that was, I mean, certainly there have been other conversations before that, but that was a conversation that in, in large part led to where we are now with this project. Um, from that, one of the other things that we did in 2016 was an ad, um, a survey of tribal advocates about firearms and domestic violence to try to gather information on the ground about the, you know, some of the challenges, some of the issues that seem to be paramount. Um, that, that, the input from the, that questionnaire became part of putting together this a tribal convening that was held this year in January of 2017 in um, Phoenix. And I am going to let Caroline t say a little bit more about what came about during the tribal convening. Hi, everyone. So some of you were actually present at the tribal convening. Um, but as Nancy stated, it um, was held in January of this past year. Um, professionals from tribal communities across the country participated. I myself participated. Um, I thought it was a really great way to sort of have an unfettered conversation about the issues in our communities specifically. And not only that, but to have a specific space dedicated to doing so. Um, as a broader Native community, we were able to identify um, the challenges to the issue of firearms in our communities, and also certain solutions to um, better protect everyone, including uh, people who might be um, victims of like attendant crime, for example. Um, and we were able to discuss opt obstacles and opportunities that were presented in tribal communities. But really, the, the convening itself was just responsive to um, traditional practice, to our culture, and also to our capacity um, for tackling an issue like this. So I think one of, we'll talk about these challenges in a second, but I want to start by saying that I think we're staring down a, a very serious, uh, I hate the word epidemic, but that is in fact what it is in Indian country um, with, and within Alaskan villages. Um, we know from the recent NIJ study, uh, that's National Institute of Justice, that 56% of um, Native American women have experienced sexual violence, 56% have experienced physical violence by an intimate partner, 96% of those women who experienced sexual violence specifically were assaulted uh, by at least one interracial partner. And 40% of them report being unable to access services. So it does lead us into this first challenge. Um, we have known for a long time that we face a lack of resources in our communities. This is both from a law enforcement perspective, it's from an advocate perspective, um, we have little access to VOCA funding. As many people know, the tribes don't have a specific set-aside. We're forced to take a pass-through from states, um, and not many states actually do that pass-through. Um, there was also brought up this idea of the balancing between victim safety and cultural traditions. Um, and I don't mean cultural traditions of uh, gun culture sort of in the national sense. Um, but more so from a ceremonial sense and from um, the way that guns might play a role in our traditional ceremonies, but also with uh, substance hunting. This is a real issue. This isn't just a hunting, you know, I want to hunt sort of issue. This is, um, I need to hunt to feed my family or I need to hunt for survival. Um, these are things that we learned from the convening. Um, well, many of us are already aware of it, but certainly in the broader sense that we have to have these conversations, and that th these are the types of balancing acts that we're doing in tribal communities. Um, there is certainly a loss of cultural identity and traditions. And then, again, this lack of services for victims and abusers. Um, other challenges that we identified clearly, um, there's, there are severe jurisdictional challenges. Um, there's a lack of jurisdiction over non-Native offenders for certain situations. Obviously, if you are um, part of some, one of the tribes that is implementing special criminal domestic violence jurisdiction, you are staring at a host of other jurisdictional issues, um, whether or not it's simply capacity or if it's just um, making sure that you have a you know, all the required systems in place. Um, there is difficulty in obtaining assistance from local, state, and federal counterparts. 
especially uh, regarding enforcement. So we know that this is the major full faith and credit issue. And then naturally we have this issue of information sharing in Indian Country and Alaska Native Villages. We don't have access to NCIC just in a broad sense. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about tribal access in a minute. Um, and then there are severe collaboration challenges um, with external professionals, specifically in the law enforcement field. Um, but also I think we're seeing with healthcare facilities as well. A positive that came out of this meeting, although <laughs> there are certainly many uh, challenges that we are looking at in tribal communities, we noted that the use of traditional practices to address the challenges were, were best. And we know this in our communities, um, right? It's, it's the, the practices that sort of infuse our culture, that, that utilize elders, that utilize language learning services. Those are the things that tend to be the most successful. Um, so we focused on was a, a restoration of lost cultural values. And this is harder in some communities because some communities were uh, will suffer a complete loss of these values um, due to assimilationist practices, whether or not it was during termination or in, in the boarding school era. Um, another solution that we discussed was firearms being held by elders when the abuser was not hunting. Um, this is something that specifically came up. Um, and then, of course, non-criminal justice solutions. We are big on restorative justice in um, our communities, and firearms really aren't um, an exception to that but really focusing on building off the accountability that's present in our communities in general. Um, and then, of course, treating tribes as sovereign nations, um, again, engaging in government-to-government -government negotiation, whether that's with DOJ, ATF, et cetera, other federal partners. That is um, another necessary component. So one thing that I was really happy about when joining this project was just learning that um, the other 50 partners were committed to assisting project sites with these challenges um, and to sharing the lessons learned with other tribal communities. Um, and again, kind of going back to what Darren said, this is not going to be a cookie cutter approach. Um, it cannot be in tribal communities. Um, there are clear differences, right, from a capacity issue, whether or not a tribe has access to NCIC, um, what MOUs you might have in place, if you do have a level of collaboration with uh, local or state law enforcement, those are all things that differentiate tribal communities that make us unique sovereign nations. Um, and those are all things that are taken into account uh, for the life of this project. So that was something I was really excited about and I know that the other partners are excited about as well. We are. We're thrilled and we're thrilled um, to have Caroline and her expertise and, um, and I think it's going to make for a very strong uh, set of, of te strong technical assistance for you all as you work through some of these challenges and, and figure out some more creative solutions in your communities. To that end, we wanted to jump in, as I mentioned earlier, and talk about the civil and criminal systems and what are some opportunities for improvement within those systems. We'll do a little map of what they look like and talk just very briefly about some of the sort of intervention points where, um, where some suggested practices can go a long way towards either learning about someone's access to guns or reacting to it by, by getting the guns away from someone who is, um, is, whose possession would be illegal. Um, the, these opportunities exist, of, of course, in Indian country as well as in other communities. And so we're going to provide a couple of examples of how um, folks in uh, tribal communities have taken advantage of some of these intervention points. Um, but we're going to talk about this stuff relatively quickly, just for time purposes. Um, as Nancy mentioned earlier, we will, I think we're going to be sending out an email with the, the PowerPoint to you all. And when we do that, we can send you the link to the previous webinar, the more general webinar, where we've gone through these in a little bit more detail and provided a couple more examples. And of course, you, know, you can give us a call if you're interested in more information. And our contact information is on the last slide. So civil protection order process. And what we're talking about in, in terms of um, improvements in civil protection order, um, the way we think about it is we sort of created this, this generic flow of what the system looks like and what the intervention points are. Of course, everyone's system is different in different ways. But, um, but this can be a, sort of a, a general way to think about these interventions. They may not fit exactly at that point in your system, but there's probably a way you can adapt it to uh, your civil protection order system. So we talk about getting the information about guns whenever we can, and there's research showing that it's important to ask about guns 
at many points in the process with many people asking that question. Issuing orders that are clear and enforceable, especially orders to surrender firearms, if that's available under your um, statutory or legal authority or tribal code. Um, ensuring that folks understand what the terms of those orders are and their obligations and how to comply with them and how to enforce them if there's noncompliance is a critical part of the process. We like to highlight service of process as a point where that not a lot of communities take advantage of in terms of getting information about guns or taking guns, actually. And so we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about that as well, and that's something we, intend, we, we anticipate we'll be working with communities on. The huge one, I think, for most people is monitoring compliance. Even if there are orders issued that either require surrender or they prohibit possession or purchase of guns, how do we keep track of that? Is there any follow-up whatsoever? Does it, does it come down to the victim having to inform someone and try to bring a contempt action or something like that? Or are there built-in systems to monitor and address compliance? That's that aspect of the system. And finally, we know that these are orders, civil protection orders expire, people ask for their guns back, or orders are dropped. And so we want to talk about having a safe and effective process for getting guns back to people who are now allowed to have them. Nancy mentioned earlier that victim autonomy and respondents' rights are two critical components of any effort to address this issue. Whenever you are trying to come up with an intervention, we believe you need to ask questions. Have I maximized opportunities for victims' voice and choice in the process? Is there autonomy, uh, are there autonomy needs being met through this process? If not, can I do something to elevate victims' voices without undermining what we're trying to accomplish? And of course, is what I'm doing protective of the um, due process and other constitutional rights of respondents. We always have to ask those questions. So let's dive in and, and do our brief overview. I'm going to start by talking about getting information about guns. I mentioned earlier that research shows that asking that question at many points can be critical to um, a, a, an appropriate response from the legal system. And so we've listed here a variety of ways that the system can find out about um, abusers' access to possession of or attempts to purchase guns. And just to focus on, uh, on one piece around advocacy, we think that advocacy and information to victims is critical to this work. And so we have examples that we like to share of questionnaires that advocates can ask, uh, can use in talking to victims generally about their needs, but specifically about guns and interview guides and things like that. And in fact, we have one example here, uh, a tool developed by one of the partners in this project, the National Center on Protection Orders and Full Faith and Credit, um, which is called the SAFE tool, which is a uh, interview guide for, for advocates. And, and one of the very simple suggestions that folks made, um, uh, especially law enforcement, about trying to get the guns, is to have a conversation. If the, if the survivor wants the guns taken away, what kind of description can we get about the guns, both the type of gun, are there serial numbers available, where are they located, and things like that can be critical to an effective law enforcement response and effective and clear orders as well by courts. And so adopting something like this in your interviewing um, with victims can go a long way towards tr to trying to get the guns. We have lots of other examples, as you know, the previous slide showed, a lot of different points at which you can get this information. We have examples for each of those, and we intend to work with our sites in, in ensuring that they're maximizing their ability to get information. I think Nancy's going to start now. Nancy? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I had it on mute for a second, sorry. Um, the, the second piece of this sort of framework, this approach that we're, we've put together is how important it is for the court to be issuing clear and enforceable surrender orders. Um, and again, we have lots of examples of these things, but I'm going to, gosh, it's just not, why am I not able to, sorry. Court should be exercising all of the available authority under tribal law and ensure that orders comply with all of the requirements necessary for them to be enforced. Um, in particular, we know, we know that the more specific the orders are, um, the, the better that is. Firearms need to be identified and which firearms are going to be surrendered or which ones would be seized. Uh, identifying them by their make and model, uh, you know, very specifically, um, specific location of the farms, where they're to be found, 
Um, these types of things make it much more certain that the order can be enforced if it's in the order itself, including instructions on how to surrender, where to surrender, um, what's the location, what's the time uh, that that, that the law enforcement agency is open or, you know, in other words, just whatever the details are, the, if it's in the order, it makes it much more easy to, for, it makes it easy for the respondent to know what's expected and it also makes it much easier for um, law enforcement to know what the process is. Again, this is an illustration of how important collaboration is because um, all of this would happen with, with their involvement. Caroline, you're going to tell us a couple of examples, I guess. Yeah, so I will quickly go through, and these are just a few examples that we found, or I'm sorry, that Nancy and Darren found that were um, that were great. So, and there are probably many more, but these are just, again, just a few to highlight them. Um, Tulalip has uh, prohibitions that are similar to uh, federal misdemeanor crimes and domestic violence and uh, civil protection prohibitions. Um, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, judges are authorized to prohibit purchase and possession uh, by CPO respondents. Um, HOOPA, similar, judges are authorized to prohibit possession and or to order surrenders in CPOs. And then CICA, is judges are authorized uh, to do the same. And Caroline, sorry for interrupting, but I, I meant to say too that one of the things that we um, emphasize is that even with, these are examples of tribes that have codes that have explicit authority, but even in situations where you have a catch-all, um, th there's a, th we, we encourage um, through this project the exercise of all authority that a court might have, including the, the use of a catch-all provision that could allow for the surrender of firearms. Right. Um, we know uh, this is another problem um, just simply because of the full faith and credit issue and the, ac the fact that tribes don't have access to NCIC um, and other databases for information sharing purposes amongst law enforcement officers, uh, getting an order in state registries is critical. Um, this is an example uh, from Umatilla, I believe, um, that they use to get into the Oregon LED system. Um, and you can just look at it briefly, and I'm sure it will be provided. Um, afterwards as well to you, but it's just an example of what one tribe is doing. Same here, um, similar form, but you'll notice that they've got the name of the restrained person and then under all that information for them, which clearly defines them as um, guns or firearms, describing any guns or firearms that you believe the restrained person owns or um, has access to including types, which means, again, kind of going back to Darren's point, that that um, resource for advocates, the safe tool that was created, um, is really helpful. A lot of people aren't aware um, of the type of gun that's present, um, or even to define, for example, a hunting rifle. Those can be subject to protective orders as well. We've touched on this briefly. Um, and if Nancy or Darren want to jump in, I'll certainly let them. But um, access to federal databases is really the key here. Without it, um, we have a serious safety issue, not only for victims, but also for responding officers and entire communities. You know, unfortunately, one, one conversation that I think repeatedly came up um, at the convening was the conversation around uh, USC Freiburg and what happened there. Um, when something wasn't entered into NCIC, um, and a community really suffered as a result of that. And it's something that, you know, the defendant in that situation had the ability to, to purchase um, additional firearms. And as many people know, his, his son um, later went on to, um, to kill several of his classmates at school. Um, but that's just one example, I think, of where our access to these databases and our lack of access to these databases really presents a serious, serious problem to tribal communities. Um, again, tribes, uh, tribal participation in NCIC or other information sharing depends on state regulations, uh, statutes, but often on policies. Um, and those policies can be disparate um, and, and really, really highly discretionary, which means that tribes are likely not going to be granted access to them. 
Um, tribes also face barriers to accessing and entering information into NCIC via state networks, again, for the same reason, also from a capacity problem as well. So a potential solution, and many of you on the phone are already aware of this program, if not your tribe is participating in it, although I believe there are only 10 who are currently participating in the Tribal Access Program. Um, this is a solution, right? So it provides kiosk workstations, training, uh, and support to enable tribes to access uh, NCIC. The DOJ serves as a criminal justice information service uh, agency. And you can enter several, including protection order and criminal cases, and it will help to trigger those uh, federal protections against prohibitions for purchasing firearms. One thing that I wanted to add here um, is that there's a lot of success in this, in this program. If you've read the most recent reports they put out, um, entries of orders of protection from February through the end of August 2016, they entered 350 order of protection related transactions, and of that, 115 disqualifying entries to prevent prohibited purchases persons from purchasing firearms. So this did have a real effect in our communities, um, and, and there are success stories that are included in that report, and I definitely encourage everybody to um, review that. This is just a map of the tribes that are already participating, and I don't believe, and Darren and Nancy can correct me, but PAP is not a prerequisite to applying for this. Uh, right, absolutely not. Right. Yeah, yeah. We we wanted to show this as a as a resource, something that's uh, that's making a difference. And um, and what if you have if you are a, a tab tribe, don't let that stop you from considering applying because we can work with you and augment what you're doing. And if you if this is the first time you've even heard of of the tab project, don't let that discourage you either. Um, it's just it's just another resource. Right. And I think one thing that's really you know, it's, I think it's, first of all, I mean, just from an advocate perspective, right, it's super traumatizing um, to get a protective order in the first place, should that be the way you choose to go. Uh, but there's a secondary trauma to having your tribal protective order or protection order, order of protection um, discredited almost until you enter it into a state system. Um, and so I think what this does is it sort of takes away that additional trauma. Um, both from an individual perspective and also from a community sort of historical trauma perspective. Um, this is just for more information about the Tribal Access Program. You can go here to www.justice.gov backslash tribal backslash TAP, and then that's their email um, address. Thank you, Caroline. So I'm going to I'm going to take over and talk a little bit about the other elements of the Civil Protection Order System. And, um, and just very briefly, so we think it's really important that folks understand what they need to do and what they're prohibited from doing under these orders and can share with you examples of informational instructional sheets that are issued along with order, surrender orders to respondents to tell them exactly what they need to do with the guns, um, the specific information that Nancy mentioned um, earlier in terms of clear and enforceable orders, also information for victims, for petitioners, about what's going to happen, if they'll be notified or not, what they should do if the guns, they find that the guns aren't turned in, and all that kind of stuff. So those, we think those instructional sheets in multiple languages where it's, where it's necessary um, and written in a way that's understandable um, are critical, really, to, to, to the efficacy of these kinds of programs. As I mentioned earlier, we like to think about service of process in these cases. There are examples of collaborative relationships between courts, I should say among courts, law enforcement agencies responsible for service of process and advocacy organizations where um, petitioners, once they're issued an emergency order, will sit down with advocates, will sit down with law enforcement and talk about a lot of things around safety, but guns specifically. What guns are there? Where are they? What are you concerned about at this point? How can we make you feel safer? How can we notify you? 
best way to notify you when service ha um, happens and whether any guns are taken, um, and are you getting the safety planning you need, um, including around the fact that this order is now going to get served on the abuser. So we have examples of those kinds of programs we would love to share with the sites in the, in, in the project and to take advantage of this service of process step. Monitoring, monitoring compliance, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge one. Um, whenever we're almost we're asked to come and talk to folks about, uh, or people call us by phone uh, to help them improve their systems, they want to know what to do once orders are issued. And we have several examples of, again, collaborative strategies between courts that issue orders and court staff, uh, law enforcement agencies that may be accepting guns that are surrendered, um, prosecutors who may have to address noncompliance, advocacy organizations that can help design that system and also can provide safety planning and other services um, for victims in the course of this process. All that kind of stuff is really, um, is, there's lots of good examples we can share with sites around how to, how to do that better. Um, simple things like getting receipts returned to the court. And if the, the receipt comes, then you won't have a compliance hearing. But if it doesn't come, there's going to be a compliance hearing um, and things like that. Finally, we never forget about the return process, even though it's kind of after the order. In this case, it will, will maybe have expired. And there are ways to ensure that guns do not go to uh, uh, abusers who are no longer subject to protection orders but have other disqualifying factors in place. And so there's processes that should be put in place by courts, by law enforcement agencies to ensure that a background check is done and that guns are not given back to people who shouldn't have them. Also that victims are part of that process, they're notified about what's happening and they have an opportunity to do further safety planning. So I went over that very quickly. There are lots of ideas we can share in those areas. If it's something you're interested in, give us a call. It certainly will be part of this project for those sites that are addressing their civil protection order system. Thanks, Darren. Um, I'm going to uh, go equally quickly through just a couple of initial slides about the criminal side of things. We have a um, similar but slightly different framework that you'll, you'll see the six boxes, but we have different contents inside for the, for the criminal side. And we have everything starting from the first call to law enforcement, the initial response at the scene. Um, and again, as Darren has been saying, we have examples for all of these things. Um, and then going to the right, um, the arraignment and other pretrial proceedings um, is, is the next critical stage where there are lots of opportunities to um, be clear about the information that we need in order to create the right result. Um, moving on to the pretrial negotiations and plea stage, which is another critical opportunity for uh, that you don't want to lose because you don't want to have people ending up in plea arrangements that somehow obviate the, uh, the uh, firearms consequences. On to trial, conviction, and sentencing. Um, and we're going to give you a really brief uh, rundown on each of these, so I'm just identifying them right now. Then we have post-conviction and probation and parole, similar to um, you know, well, what happens after the conviction as far as actual surrender, um, actual getting the, the weapons. Um, and then compliance monitoring and safe and effective returns, very similar to, the, to what we have in the, in the civil setting. And I'll let Caroline go ahead. Whoops. Go ahead. What is this not doing this? Caroline? So really quickly, just to discuss 911 call and initial response, uh, at the outset, first of all, we understand that not every tribe has access to 911, that that is definitely um, a, a problem, an ongoing problem. Um, and regardless, whoever is responding, because you will have some sort of responder, they need to develop protocol for firearms um, use and access victim needs uh, to be able to explain. The victim needs to be able to explain where they are. All of these are certain things that have to come up. Um, but really, the law enforcement agency needs to implement a protocol for handing, handling DV911 calls that address uh, firearms use and access. And I think one good example is on uh, the next page here. So Oglala Sioux, under their rule of criminal procedure, before releasing a person arrested for or charged with a crime involving DV or a violation of uh, DV protection order, the court can impose a uh conditions of release and or bail on the person to protect the alleged victim of, oh, I'm sorry, this is Ned's here, sorry. Um, can, so 
under Section 211, they can seize all weapons that are alleged to have been involved in or threatened to be used in a crime, which I think is a critical piece, um, or any weapon in the immediate vicinity. So basically, we have um, weapons used to threat and then the proximity of it. But they should also see the weapon that's in plain view. And then this part that I that I really liked was the seizure of weapons without regard to ownership of the weapon. Um, so those that are owned by a third party are subject to confiscation when officers conclude that the weapon was used in the commission of a crime. Um, and I think that's just a really good example. Again, that's just one example um, that we wanted to discuss. But also, mandatory DV incident reports should include firearms information, including access to use of the firearms and uh, numerical identifiers for the abuser. Darren? So in the pretrial hearing piece, um, what's important to recognize, Nancy mentioned it um, earlier, is the fact that um, these are opportunities to issue orders to surrender potentially um, of, of firearms. It's an opportunity to learn more information about access to guns through a review of the police report, which hopefully will um, do what, what Caroline just pointed out. Also, to the extent there's any kind of pretrial services, they can do an investigation as to access to guns. Um, and, um, and, those, and those orders that are issued the, uh, at arraignment, the conditions of release, the bond can bail conditions can have specific um, you must surrender all your firearms type provisions um, depending on your legal authority uh, in, your, in your community. And we've seen, we have examples we can share of those kinds of orders. Of course, in a criminal case, you now have an extra enforcement mechanism, right? You can, uh, in a criminal case, the person who has been released on bond or bail can, uh, can be incarcerated pre-trial if they continue to possess their gun. So there's a little bit extra enforcement ability that's available under those circumstances. We wanted to um, provide one example here from the Nez Perce tribe um, of a, um, a criminal procedural rule that specifically includes orders prohibiting the person from using or possessing a gun or other weapon as specified by the court as part of the pre-trial release conditions. Um, and so if your code has that, great, your judges should be exercising that authority. If your code does not have that, there is likely to be some discretion in what judges will issue in terms of pretrial release orders, bail bond condition orders um, that can include no possession um, or purchase of weapons as well. We'll work with um, communities in this project to figure out how to maximize um, their ability to keep guns out of the hands of people who have now been arrested for an offense and are undergoing um, a, a, a proceeding for trial. The pre-trial negotiations piece is exactly what Nancy said earlier around being aware that if you negotiate down to a disorderly, you may have just negated the ability to hold people accountable under um, tribal, sometimes state, and federal law. Um, for possession of a firearm. So we want prosecutors to understand that as they enter into negotiations. It's possible that a plea agreement um, for a, a conviction that would not trigger these other laws can still include a no firearm possession or purchase provision uh, under, uh, under the laws of many, many jurisdictions around the country. In addition, we hope that judges will not accept pleas uh, plea deals, if they're concerned about guns, if they know that that, that ultimate plea is going to result in an offense that doesn't uh, invoke any of those um, firearm prohibitions. So those are the kinds of things that we think about in terms of pretrial negotiation and plea uh, for trial conviction and sentencing and also for post-conviction. Um, we think about creating a record of the conviction that is going to make the conviction one that, um, that prohibits someone under governing tribal law or federal law from, from uh, possessing or purchasing firearms. The conviction needs to be, if it's not a felony conviction, if it's a misdemeanor conviction, needs to have certain uh, characteristics to qualify under the federal law. We work with communities to make sure that their orders of conviction, for instance, list out all of those factors so that the FBI, if it's doing a background check or if a prosecutor is thinking about bringing a case, can establish that this, tri this conviction under tribal law is a predicate offense, an offense that triggers that federal or other prohibition. And so there are lots of ideas about how to make that happen effectively. Um, 
after conviction, conviction orders uh, can include no possession of firearms in many instances. In addition, probation and parole officers after conviction um, have powers to ensure that if people purchase guns, that some steps can be taken um, to, 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 to punish them and to get the guns taken away as well. So those are the kinds of things that we think of post-conviction. Finally, the compliance monitoring and safe return processes are really parallel to what I mentioned earlier uh, on the civil side of things. And so if you have a either pretrial order or a post-trial order or someone is now prohibited from possessing or purchasing guns because of a, co a conviction, how do you monitor whether that person gets guns or not? What do you do if the person does get guns in terms of a subsequent prosecution or them being held in contempt or something like that? Um, those are the kinds of things that we work with folks in this area. And of course, if uh, in some instances, post um, serving of the sentence, it may be that the person can get the gun back um, or maybe they're not uh, convicted and there was a pretrial order not to possess guns. They want their guns back. And a safe and effective return process is important there. The other thing I should mention that we haven't had a chance to mention yet, um, but just so you know that it's on our radar screen, because it may be on many of your radar screens as well, is what about the idea of someone giving his gun to his brother or his dad so that he doesn't technically possess the gun, but he may have access to that gun. Those kinds of third-party transfers are ones that we think the courts and others should be monitoring, and so we have a set of strategies around that process as well to ensure that the person who gets the gun, the third party, is first of all allowed to have the gun. It's not illegal for them to possess a gun. And secondly, that they will not allow access to that gun by the prohibited person. So again, we have lots of strategies around um, those kinds of issues as well. So we know that we are, again, at the top of the hour, and we... Um, are, are happy to take questions if people want to stay on for a few minutes, but I uh, also want to acknowledge that we've covered a tremendous amount of material in a very fast and short period of time. Um, and, and really what we wanted to do is, is let you know that we have a lot of tools in the toolbox, so to speak, and we're really looking forward to, to working with communities to ex implement some of these strategies and see which ones work best. Um, and, and which ones work for you. So really ultimately we're hope, wanting to encourage all of you to consider applying to be a pilot site. Um, and as Darren mentioned earlier, even if that doesn't end up happening, um, we encourage you to contact us for uh, TA and on, on firearms and domestic violence. If you have a question, I, I don't see any posted right now. Um, but we can stay on for a few minutes if there are any questions. So it looks like um, <laughs> we've either answered everyone's questions or probably presented a lot of information for you to think about. Um, and my contact information is on that last slide, the resources slide. That's my email address, nhart. Um, that's, that's, and, and that's probably the best way to ask any questions. Or you can also reply to the person who sent out your link for this webinar, and uh, that's how you'll get your link for this recording. Thank you very much for participating today. We really you know, appreciate your time. And thank you, Caroline, as well. Thank you, yes. guys. So we're going to uh, close out the webinar and uh, again welcome you to contact us if you have any questions.